Well, good evening, Brian. Welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, number 337, uh, our 26th Zoom lecture in our lockdown lecture series. I can't believe, Brian, we're now in September. Uh, March seems only a few weeks ago, but nearly six months we've been doing this, and it's a pleasure yeah. to have you all with us. As usual, Brian, can I remind you of the Gland Lodge of Scotland guidelines for Zoom meetings? Please uh, ensure that you've got your video working and you have a name in front of you so I can recognise you. That would be very much appreciated. Can I ask you all to sign the virtual tile on our Facebook page? Uh, and if there's any questions, if there's any questions for our speaker this evening, Brian, have you heard any of I've just said? No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. If you've got any questions for our speaker this evening, I can ask you to put them into the chat room. Uh, as usual, we will be recording this and it will be uploaded to our YouTube pages later on this evening. Brian, many uh, years ago, uh, I served in the Royal Air Force, as many of you know, and uh, I was uh, in one of the registries in the big house at RAF Rhind Allen. And for nine months of the 12 months I served there, this uh, civilian came with uh, a bunch of envelopes that needed to be posted. And I've posted them with a lot of moans every every month because I thought, this isn't military, this is some civ civvy giving me this hundred and odd envelopes. Uh, at around month 10, I found out there were actually billets for the Lodge Star of Saxony under the United Grand Lodge of British Freemasons in Germany. Uh, and as soon as I found that out, I was then able to go to three or four meetings in Germany. Uh, so it gives me the greatest of pleasure to welcome one of our German brethren to us this evening, Brother Rolf Keel. He's been a member of the craft for 33 years. Uh, and he's been a member of a Scottish lodge since 2009, when he became an honorary member of Lodge Friendship 1712 over in Edinburgh. Uh, he's a past master of his mother lodge, and he's a deputy district ma grand master in the province of Hessen. So it gives me the greatest of pleasure to welcome Brother Rolf this evening to give us an insight into Freemasonry in Germany. Please enjoy, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, first, let me try to share my screen with you. Okay. Brethren, it's a pleasure to be here. and. It's, um, yeah, it, it's a pleasure to talk to you about um, nearly 300 years of Freemasonry in Germany. Um, I will do my very best, um, try not to confuse you too much. Um, but while it's true that we Germans are super efficient and have, have absolutely no humor, nobody, nobody ever accused us for doing things plain and simple. So I can give no guarantee for not confusing you, but I will do my very best. Um, Usually, moment. Uh, yep. Usually, when we talk about uh, the craft in Germany, the first thing that comes to our mind is um, moment. The first thing that comes to our mind is the tradition of the stonemasons or st uh, Steinmetz tradition in uh, Germany. And um, indeed, this is a very old tradition. Um, as you see on the slide, you see uh, stonemason lay process from monastery large in um, from the 13th century and stone masons from a profane large from the 15th century um, and what you see here is a seal and the coat of arms of the lodge in Strasbourg um, which is one of the main lodges which was one of the main lodges in uh, German territory at that time and you see you should see a moment. Yes. At the time of the uh, Steinmetz stonemasons, there was four main lodges um, in Germany, which was Cologne, which was Strasbourg, which was um, Bern for Switzerland, uh, which was Vienna for Austria. And the white lines marked the uh, spheres of influence of this uh, Grand lodges, as you can call it. Um, but although it's true they had an esoteric knowledge, they had a secret handshake. And um, they had a kind of a Grand Lodge system and statues very much alike the Shaw statues. Um, there's no direct link between um, 
the tradition of the stonemasons and the craft as we know it today. So I will focus on the craft as we know it today. Um, and when I talk about the foundation of um, the craft in Germany, we need to take a look at a map, a political map at this time. What you see here is the crown of the emperor, and then you see a very colorful entity. This is the uh, Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. And within this empire, you see many colorful spots, which were uh, duchies, earldoms, independent cities, counties. Um, so the Holy Roman Empire never developed into a unitary state such as France or England, but it overcame many of its territories like a kind of an umbrella association. Um, these nearly independent principalities, kingdoms and so on, um, had seen the emperor at least as an ideal. And of course they were subject to the imperial laws to the imperial jurisdiction and to the decisions of the Reichstag. But at the same time, they were able to participate in the, pro in the decision-making process. So they could they were able to influence the system for themselves. Voltaire, French brother with good wit, um, described this Holy Roman Empire as he said, this corpus which still call itself the Holy Roman Empire is in no way sacred nor is it Roman, nor is it an empire. This was pretty true. So, let's see. Um, I will focus um, on, on the craft uh, at the beginning. And here you see on the slide, Count Albrecht Wolfgang von schaumburg lippe He was the first German Freemason, which we know of. He was made a Freemason in 723 in London, and his name can be found in the minute book of Lodgehammer and Crape in the year 725. Um, the next one we know of is a brother Tuanus or De Tom, who was appointed as a provincial grandmaster for Lower Saxony, but it's very unsecure if he ever reached his province because he's left absolutely no trace in history. And the same can be said for 11 gentlemen, German brothers who received a charter for a lodge in Hamburg in the year 733. Again, there's no proof that this lodge was ever founded. However, Freemasonry at this time was known in Germany. This is a, the oldest book we could find uh, in German language, which is um, Pritchett's Masonry Dissected in translation from 736. So there must have been Freemasons at this time in Germany, um, but we have no proof of a lodge existing. What we know is a year later, lodge, a lodge was uh, founded in Hamburg, which, is a lodge, which was called the Lodge, lodge d'Amburg, and later it changed its name to Absalom to the Three Nettles. This is the oldest lodge in Germany still in existence and um, this lodge is from particular um, importance for the craft in Germany since already in the first year of its existence it was able to carry out the initiation of Crown Prince Frederick for Prussia after King Frederick II into the craft and this happened because the Count of Schaumburg Klippe which we already know participated in a, in a table talk about, um, at the king's table um, about Freemasonry where he defended the craft and where he, um, um, where he said that he, he was a member of the craft and this caught the attention of Frederick, the, uh, of Frederick the Great who wanted to become a Freemason also. In the year 1740, Georg Wilhelm von Oberg the Worshipful Master traveled to London where he received a charter for his lodge with a number 108 and he received the title as an English Provincial Grandmaster for Hamburg and Lower Saxony. After his return he established the Provincial Grand Lodge and established further lodges throughout the area. 
The initiation of Frederick II cannot be overestimated for the success in Freemasonry in Germany. Immediately after his accession to the throne, the king publicly declared himself as a Freemason. And he set up his own lodge and he allowed him to do so further run. Um, yep. In September 1740, a lodge was opened in Berlin. And this is the current mother lodge to the three globes. You see the foundation document and you see the seal of the Grand Lodge here. So. The Crown Prince of Prussia then made uh, his brother-in-law, Magra Frederick von Bayreuth, uh, to a Freemason. He initiated him into the craft in the year 1741. After his return to his own court, Frederick von Bayreuth erected a lodge which acted as a provincial grand lodge in this area of Bavaria. And again, founded lodges and became the mother of the grand lodge of the sun in Bavaria. In the east of Germany, the Count of Rutkowski, the son of the Saxonian king, was appointed as a provincial grandmaster for Upper Saxony. And he founded a lodge in 1738, the lodge to the three white eagles and other lodges followed us soon. The next step was Frankfurt, where the lodge L'Union was founded in the year 1741. We have the foundation document and we have the jewel of the lodge and the attendance book. And um, this lodge had also became a provincial grand lodge uh, for this area and again founded daughter lodges all over the country. And the same happened in Hannover where another English provincial grand lodge was installed. But apart from the English influence, very shortly after the foundation of the, um, of the first lodges, the French influence also came into form. At that time, the French way of thinking and living was desirable for the rich, for the famous, and for the nobility. The French language was spoken in sophisticated circles in Germany, and most of the lodges worked in French language. And it's often said that um, the Crown Prince Frederick, later King Frederick uh, the Great, was more fluent in writing in French language than he ever was in German language. Um, so, Several lodges were founded with the help of the French and under, under French influence. This happened all over the country, in Frankfurt, in Mannheim, in Magdeburg. Yeah, you see, here you see French brothers from that time. And in a French museum, you see a typical French Freemasons temple at this time. Let's Take another look at the map and you see something has changed. Many of the tiny spots have disappeared. And um, there's a new player. All what is pink is now Prussia. And Prussia was, a, after the Seven Years' War, Prussia was on the way to, to become the leading power of Germany. This is very important for the further development of the craft in Germany because it took a very, very different path. The red spots you see here on this map show you the central points from where Freemasonry was rolled out. Hamburg, Hanover, Berlin, Leipzig, Bayreuth, and Frankfurt. Freemasonry was, as, as I said before, there was no such a thing that a, that a German state. There were different kingdoms, different earldoms. So, what we never had was one united force in Freemasonry. We had different traditions, different grand lodges, um, but there was one force um, which could have been able to unite all these different grand lodges. And now I'm talking about the high order of the Knights of the Holy Temple of Jerusalem, better known as the strict observance. And at this time, 
as I thought to myself, you can't talk to a Scottish president without a Scottish twist in, in your speech, and here it comes. Um, Ramsay, a baker's son from Ayr, born in the year 1681, changed the, the face of Freemasonry forever. His name was Charles Edward Andrew Ramsay. He was raised as a Calvinist, converted later to Roman Catholicism. James, the old pretender, knighted him in 1723. In 24, he was in Rome as a tutor of Charles Edward Stuart. He became a fellow of the Royal Society in 29 and was initiated into the craft in 1730. He worked and he lived in Paris. He was a staunch Jacobite. And in 1736, he wrote one of the most influential speeches in Freemasonry ever. And I quote him now. In the times of the Holy Wars in Palestine, several princes, lords, artists associated swore to reestablish the temples of the Christians in the Holy Land and to use their signs and their goods to bring back architecture to its pristine institution. They recalled all ancient signs and mysterious words of Solomon in order to distinguish themselves from the infidels and make themselves known to each other. Ever since then, our lodges in all countries were called the lodges of St. John. Prince Edward brought back all his Masonic brethren and his colony of adepts settled in England. And having ascended the throne, he declared himself a Grand Master of the Order. And from that time, our brotherhood took the name of Freemasons. And furthermore, he said, from the British Isles, the royal art is now repassing into France, which will become the center of the order. And he went on, the obligations imposed to you by the order are to pr protect your brothers by your authority, to enlighten them by your knowledge, to edify them by your virtues, to suffer them in their necessities, to sacrifice all personal resentment, and to strive after all that may contribute to the peace and uni unity of society. For a long time, we were taught that Ramsey invented the Templar legend in Freemasonry. Now we know, thanks to the work of uh, Alan Banheim, John Snow, Joe Wages, and others, that he don't, that he haven't invented it. Uh, indeed, there was a Templar tradition before, and um, but Ramsey, without doubt, raised it to a new haze. An interesting question for another evening could be why was Ramsey so successful? And to answer this, we might have to recall that at the time of Ramsey's speech, there was a huge, really huge exile community of Jacobites in France, mainly Irish, but also English and uh, Scottish Jacobites with the own Masonic tradition as well. So when we look at the Grand Masters in France at this time, we had um, the Duke of Wharton, who was Grand Master in the year 20, 1728. We had a Knight Baronet of Scotland, Hector McLean, in 1735. And we had Count Charles Radcliffe of Derwentwater in 76 until 78, the time of Ramsey's speech. All of them hardcore Jacobites. So indeed, there was a link between Ramsey and the Jacobites and Freemasonry. However, as I said, Ramsey's oration fueled the fantasy of many numerous Scottish rites came into life, and one of them was a strict observance, founded by a Baron of Hunt, who brought this system from France to Germany in around 1750. He found many followers after the end of the Seven Year War, and strict observance spread from 1765 all over Germany. And it's clear that the good Baron clearly had jumped the Jacobite train. There were even rumors that he received the secrets of his order from no one else but Charles Edward Stuart, a Carboni Prince Charlie. The strict observance was based on the legend that the order of the Templars, which was abolished in 1314, had been replanted in Scotland by some knights who escaped the general annihilation and received important secrets from the last master of the order, Jacques de Molay, just before his death, and was now called to a new existence in the form of Freemasonry. Four higher degrees were added to the three degrees of masonry, namely the Scottish master, in which all of those who did not want to be, 
given the knightly decrees had to remain. Then there was a novice decree, the knight's decree, and finally the seventh decree of the Eccles professors. The Grand Lodge of the Three Globes and many of the English provincial lodges joined this new and somehow exciting system. It found supporters among princes and high lords. The Duke Ferdinand of Braunschweig was appointed as a general grand master in the year 1772. New lodges were founded, the old ones were moved over or closed, and the stated purpose was the unification of all German lodges under the system of the strict observance. The system had at first glance a lot of impressive assets because of the pompousness of its appearance, by the high personalities associated with it, and by the mystery of its organization. So representatives of the strict observance had invoked unknown superiors. They had promised their followers important information about the craft, which was to prove that only their understanding of Freemasonry was genuine and all, all other Masonic ways were wrong. But after a while, when the mysterious superiors did not want to appear, when the information of Masonic secrets could, have, could not have been revealed, disillusionment gradually arose. And the followers of the old ways in Freemasonry reappeared on the stage, declaring the whole new system a great fraud. Some supporters of the strict observance were also dissatisfied. If they did not want to be allowed to participate in the privileges of the higher degrees, and so the whole system started to crumble. Some other reasons as well. The Grand Lodge to the Three Globes had joined very early in the year 1765. However, it faced a fierce opponent in one of its former superiors. Johann Wilhelm Kellner von Zinnendorf. Originally, he had been a supporter of the strict observance. Then he had thrown himself over with his Grand Lodge. He had contacted Sweden and he received from Sweden the files of the Swedish Rite and the Charter. And based on this, he independently built lodges. And in 1770, they joined together to the Grand Lodge of Freemasons of Germany. And this Grand Lodge gained a great deal of expansion. In 1774, Zinnendorf's Grand Lodge entered into a treaty with England, according to which all of the English provincial lodges in Germany were to be transferred successively. This contract did not come into play in the planned way, but it may well have been a concern of the three globes that they going to lose their superior status to the new Grand Lodge. And so the leaders of the three globes started to feel uneasy with the system of the strict observance. That was a situation when delegates, 33 delegates from Germany, from Austria and France assembled for 50 days in Wilhelmsbad nearby Frankfurt to discuss the future of the system of the strict observance. The convent itself could be the issue of a special evening as well. We have the secret protocols that show superstition, credulity, enthusiasm, intrigues and nightly talks, brave men, adventurers and rogues. And the convent of Wilhelmsbad also includes the Illuminati's attempt to infiltrate Freemasonry because one of the delegates uh, acted as an undercover agent for Adam Weishaupt. At the end of the convent, the legend of the Knights Templar heritage of Freemasonry was buried and the strict observance died shortly after its funeral. It survived somehow in the rectified rite, but again, that's another story for another evening. As one result, in 1783, the Eclectic Masonic Union, somehow an Illuminati offspring, was seated in Frankfurt, was founded from the rubble of the strict observance. And its aim was to bring Freemasonry back to the old deistic system with only three degrees. Hamburg, also officially left in the same year, and soon again, choose an English provincial grandmaster. And the Grand Lodge to the Three Clubs left also in 783 and declared itself completely free of all Masonic dependence. It had names as it wanted. So 
thus ended this period in German masonry and the time until the end of the century was generally devoted to consolidation within each Grand Lodge with reform on the agenda in usage and in ritual. There was another, oops, not too early. Just early. There was another broke um, in the three clubs and in the year 1797, another Grand Lodge was founded, which was the Grand Lodge Royal York to Freundschaft, um, called Royal York because they were able to initiate the Prince of York in the year 1760. So we had at this time three Grand Lodges in Prussia, the Swedish Rite, the three clubs and Royal York to Freundschaft. Freemasonry in Germany was never designed to be open for the common man. Even at the times before World War I, when the craft was most popular in Germany, there were never more than 80,000 Freemasons in Germany. And perhaps of the early ties to the Prussian court, chiefly men of the gentry, nobles, officers, later on poets, artists, literati, and much later merchants joined its ranks. Two of the German emperors were Freemasons and the craft in Prussia gained profit out of this connection. The Prussian Grand Lodges were granted a special privilege in 1998, in 1798. In particular, all other Masonic and other lodges of the Masonic order should be considered forbidden, tolerated under no pretext in the Prussian lands. And as a result of this, Freemasonry was shown a very specific path for the largest German state, Prussia, which were of decisive importance for the further development of the craft in Germany. One important landmark was the three Prussian lodges admitted only men of Christian faith into their ranks. Now we have Napoleon on the gates. This was Royal York's Freundschaft. We have Napoleon on the gates. Um, oh, sorry, Brethren. Um, what you see here in pink is under Napoleonic influence. And you see nearly all of Germany was under Napoleonic influence except uh, Austria. And this also brought new conditions to the Masonic relationships in Germany. In the parts of the country occupied by the French, the influence of the Corps Orient de France was felt by the establishment of lodges in Frankfurt, in Hanover, in Hamburg, in Lübeck. The Saxon lodges were forced to join together to form a Grand Lodge. The Bavarian lodges had to do the same. The Provincial Lodge of Hamburg had to give up his, its ties to England and declare itself an independent Grand Lodge in order to evade the annexation by the Corps Orient. And for the Kingdom of Westphalia, another Corps Orient was established in Kassel. This was a picture at the end of the war of liberation, as we call it in Germany. And you see Freemasonry has spread all over the land, but you see also um, mainly in the big cities in Berlin, in Hamburg, in Frankfurt, and it's the majority of lodges were in the parts of Germany, which were later called East Germany. Um, we had, after the War of Liberation, we had um, the situation that we had the three, the three Prussian lodges, now called the Old Prussian Grand Lodges, and we had independent Grand Lodges in Hamburg, in Bavaria, in Saxony, in Hannover, Kassel, and in Darmstadt. And all these lodges practiced mutual recognition and visitation, but they were completely independent. And they formed a kind of a federation called the Großlogenbund, the League of, League of Grand Lodges in 1860, to discuss the ways of the craft in Germany. This picture is painted by Lois Corinth, a German brother, who painted it in 1890. And it shows you that the German brethren have taken the joint Freemasonry very serious, and we still do. <clears throat> so the situation of mutual recognition um, remained unchanged until the end of, the, of um, World War I. And after World War I, the situation in Germany changed tremendously. 
the monarchy was gone, Germany was now a republic, and the heat and the atmosphere, political atmosphere was very, very heated. And there was massive anti-Masonic attacks launched by the Roman Catholic side as well as the rising Nazi movement. And on the picture here, you see the church and Freemasonry on the shoulders of the common man fighting. You see a leaflet, Kampf der Freimaurerei, fight against Freemasonry. You see a Nazi brochure. Um, and you see an initiative to ban all secret societies um, and Freemasonry, of course. And the craft was in no way prepared to handle these attacks. Since time immemorial, there has been quarrel bet quarrels between the so-called Old Prussian Lodges and the other Grand Lodges in Germany, which calls themselves the humanitarian Grand Lodges to mark the difference to the strictly Christian Grand Lodges of Bourgeois. And after World War I, this friction had grown deeper. One main issue was, of course, the Jewish question. As I said before, the Prussian Grand Lodges admitted only Christian men into the order, while the other Grand Lodges were open, in this, were open for Jews. <clears throat> and the second friction was the behavior of the old Prussians after, after World War I, which was strictly nationalistic, denying any international approach in Freemasonry. Also, it's simplifying the subject. It's not wrong to state that the old Prussian Grand Lodges felt that the loss of World War I was a national disgrace, and they have seen the Treaty of Versailles as very unjust, especially by giving Germany the full liability for the war. And that view was shared by the large majority of German population. The Prussian Grand Lodges had strong ties to the German Emperor, as we've seen. They have had difficulties to adapt to the situation of the German Republic. And so the old Prussian Grand Lodges had chosen a way of isolation and refused any contact to Masonic bodies of the so-called enemy powers. And the, in 1922, the old Prussian Grand Lodge stepped out of the League of Grand Lodges and justified the step, and I quote, with the pacifistic and cosmopolitical views of the other Grand Lodges and their attacks against the standpoint of the Christian Grand Lodges and in the Jewish question. In my opinion, this argument reversed cause and effect, for it was the old Prussian Lodges which left the common ground of the craft laid down in the old charges of 723 by refusing Jews the privilege joining the craft. Some Christian grand lodges went a step further and shut their doors for anyone, except men with a proven Aryan heritage. And with the changes of the time and the Nazi party at its on the horizon, some grand lodges tried to cope with the situation and find an agreement with the new leaders. What you see here is the last declaration of the Prussian Grand Lodge Royal York zur Freundschaft, uh, which was at this declaration no longer the Grand Lodge Royal York zur Freundschaft. And um, it was, it styled itself as the German Christian Order for Friendship. And <clears throat> I translated points six and seven on the declaration for you and shows you that only men. Only German men of Aryan descent can be members of the order. Jews and Marxists were excluded. And uh, no war, more vows of secrecy in the German Christian order for friendship. And nearly the same happened. Nearly the same happened with the old, um, other old Prussian lodges as well. Um, moment. At the 12th of April in 1933, the Grand Lodge of the Three Globes wrote to the executives of the National Socialist German Workers' Party. We have decided to change the name of our order to the National Christian Order Frederick the Great. Since the year, the relations to the German lodges which initiated Jews or men from Jewish descent have been definitely abandoned. The vast majority of our members count itself by attitude and by conviction as followers of the German national, Nationalist Social uh, National Socialist German Workers' Party, and the leaders of our orders are blessed by the same spirit. Let us think for a while, brother. However, the drift of the old Prussian Grand Lodges 
by membership, the vast majority of brothers in Germany towards the extreme nationalists has the pressure to the other Grand Lodges as well, because they were attacked as not trustworthy, unpatriotic, etc. And as a reaction, some of the Grand Lodges tried to adapt themselves to the zeitgeist. Resistance against the coming Nazi regime came from two small Grand Lodges, both of them not recognized by any of the other Grand Lodges in Germany. This was the Freemasons Union of the Rising Sun and the symbolic Grand Lodge of Germany. Together, probably 2,600 brother, brothers. A unique position was held by the Grand Lodge of the Eclectic Union in Frankfurt. This Grand Lodge had two Jewish grandmasters between 1901 and 1918. It was open for men for, of every creed, and it always supported the, the idea of Freemasonry as something of a world-spanning movement. And so the eclectic, the eclectic Union was the first of the recognized Grand Lodges, which had tried to reestablish contacts with the French Freemasons in the year 1927. It therefore was shunned by the other Grand Lodges and the public opinion. And the last elected, elected Grand Master of the Eclectic Union, Professor Ganser, steered his Grand Lodge together with the Grand Lodges of Hamburg and Bayreuth towards negotiations with the United Grand Lodge of England in the year 1932 in order to re-establish Masonic contacts. Those negotiations with the United Grand Lodge of England were answered by the old Prussian lodges. They severed all ties and did not recognize them any further. However, in spring 1933, the Nazi government was just in the first months of existence. The Eclectic Union, the Grand Lodge of Bayreuth, and other Grand Lodges closed their doors and shut down the work. Some former humanitarian Grand Lodges in Hamburg, in Saxony, and Darmstadt finally adopted the Aryan article and were forcing Jewish precious persons to leave the lodges. So it's fair to say that regular and recognized Freemasonry did not exist after 1933. Germany was in a state of total darkness. The light of the Grand Lodge of Hamburg was taken to Chile and to Palestine, where German lodges of that jurisdiction continued their work. The old Prussian lodges, now under the sale of the National Christian Orders, continued until 1935. And on the slide you see here, we see the decree from 1935 that all remaining lodges and orders in Germany were dissolved and their property was confiscated by the Nazi German, by the German Nazi government. Therefore, Freemasonry remained completely suppressed until the end of the Second World War in 1945. Shortly after the war, the craft rapidly reestablished itself in West Germany. Freemasonry remained suppressed in the East under Soviet rule until the reunification in 1989. Remember the map that the East of Germany was the biggest stronghold of the old Prussian Grand Lodges, and Prussia was part of the Soviet zone, and that changed the balance of power in between German Freemasonry complete, because before the Nazi regime 80% of the German brothers belonged to the old Prussian uh, Grand Lodges. And now it's after the war, the situation was completely uh, on, the other, on the other way. However, in the year 1949, representatives of 151 German Lodges from seven former Grand Lodges met at Frankfurt and founded the United Grand Lodge of German Freemasons. And their aim was to overcome the quarrels of the past. Um, however, complete unity was still not achieved. The Grand Lodge of the Swedish Rite was not able to join due to governmental and ritualistic difficulties. On the picture, you see the first Grand Master, Theodor Vogel, and you see the assembly in the, in the Paulskirche in Frankfurt where 
Theodor Vogel was made a grandmaster of the order. But as I said, also it was called the United Grand Lodge. Unity was still not achieved and it needed some further advice on some well dosed pressure from the Grand Lodges of England, Ireland and Scotland to, re to bring the remaining opponents closer together. And as a result, the United Grand Lodges of Germany were founded in 1958 with a membership of 264 lodges of the Grand Lodge AF and AM, which was the former United Grand Lodge, along with 82 lodges from the Swedish Rite from the Order of Freemasons. The basis of this unity was a Magna Carta, which passed the sovereignty to the United Grand Lodges, but maintained the two forming bodies as Grand Lodges as well. In the following step, the Grand Lodge of the Three Globes, which had now been re-established in Berlin, joined the United Grand Lodges as a third Grand Lodge in 1970. Since the end of the Second World War, a large number of English-speaking lodges had been founded in Germany by stationed American, Canadian or British groups. And these lodges formed themselves into two provincial Grand Lodges, namely the American-Canadian Grand Lodge, AF and AM, and the Grand Lodge of British Freemasons in Germany. Whereupon they both affiliated with the United Grand Lodges in and in 1970, the status of the three laterally joining Grand Lodges was changed under an amended Magna Carta. So, German Freemasonry has a unique system of five largely independent Grand Lodges bonded together under the roof of the United Grand Lodges of Germany, united to form one sovereign Grand Body. This unification was designed to accomplish two basic goals. First, to facilitate the need to regain recognition for German Freemasonry after the World War II. And second, to unite the different Masonic systems existing in Germany under one common roof. The Magna Carta, the constitution of the United Grand Lodges provides a legal framework. The governing body of the United Grand Lodges is a Senate composed of members elected or appointed by their Grand Lodges based on the proportionate membership representation. And you see the Grand Lodge AF and AM have five members, Grand Lodge of the British Freemasons have three members, um, of the Swedish Rite have three members, all the other Grand Lodges have one member in the Senate. And as I said, within the United Grand Lodges, these five Grand Lodges are autonomous. They govern their own internal affairs, but of course there are specific restrictions are placed on their activities. They cannot individually preempt the rights of the United Grand Lodges. And since the United Grand Lodge is recognized and acknowledged as a sovereign Grand Lodge in Germany, each Grand Lodge within the United Grand Lodges enjoys recognition only as a result of its membership in the United Grand Lodge. Fraternal relations with other Grand Lodges, including any exchange of representatives, are strictly within the sphere of the responsibility of the United Grand Lodges. The same as correspondence between Grand Lodges must be channeled through the United Grand Lodges as well. The Magna Carta contained rules for electing a Grandmaster and a Deputy Grandmaster, regulations for the regular convening of a communication, which is called a convent in Germany, and various other rules for the government of the United Grand Lodges. So in effect, a federal or collective voice exists for recognized Freemasonry in Germany. And as a result of this partnership in the United Grand Lodges, each partner is involved in the decision-making pro uh, process. Not very much unlike the first slide I show you um, with the German em Empire as a federal entity. It's, and we came back to this federal entity now in the United Grand Lodges of Germany. Um, Here you see the first Grandmaster, Theodor Vogel, and you see our current Grandmaster, Christoph Busbach. And it is a very unique system. It's um, sometimes a nerve-stretching system because it needs a whole lot of permanent negotiations between the partners. But as I mentioned before, nobody ever accused us of making things plain and simple. So 
but it works. Um, and also the peculiar system of the United Grand Lodge has had these efforts as well. We have the freedom to visit very different rituals. We have the freedom to learn very different aspects of the craft because of the traditions of the, of the old Grand Lodges. And after 220 years of permanent quarrels, we have found a peaceful solution for our own mutual benefit. There are around about 15,000 regular Freemasons in Germany now, organized in 500 lodges. The, by far the biggest Grand Lodge is AF and AM, followed by the Swedish Rite, followed by um, the Three Globes and the American Canadian Grand Lodge and the Grand Lodge of British Freemasons in Germany, which has since a few years a Scottish Lodge as well, Sissel and Saltire, working a Scottish ritual. So, Reson, the craft is lively in Germany and um, we have, we do public evenings once a month in my lodge and we have many good, many young men of very good education waiting to join our ranks. So I'm very optimistic for the future of Freemasonry in Germany. However, in, in, moment, in, in the time of Corona, our lodges have been closed as well as your lodges, but tomorrow we will have our first physical meeting since over half a year. So I'm look, really looking forward to um, our first degree work under Corona conditions. I will keep you informed uh, if and how this has worked. Um, Preston, I have had to run over 300 years of Masonic history in just a few minutes. I happily await your questions, your suggestions and your comments. Thank you very much for your attention. Brother Rolf Kale, thank you so much on behalf of the members of the Lodge Hope of and all our visitors here this evening. Yes, a, a very interesting subject and the questions that we already have for you in the chat room pay testament to that. So I will try to scroll back up for you uh, and ask the first couple of questions. Uh, the first one that I did see, Rolf, uh, Early on in the presentation, you showed a, a, a duel from Frankfurt and it had the letter yes. G within it. Do all the German lodges use the letter G? Um, no, no. Um, this is um, part of the, as you see, Frankfurt is, um, Frankfurt is um, founded as a provincial grand lodge of England. And though they have the letters, they have the letter G in it, but not all German lodges have the letter G. Okay, thank you. The next question, uh, Siva believes he heard you say when you referred to the 15th century lodge as profane. He's curious why you called them profane. Um, well, that's, that's a, um, it, it, it's a German usage. It, um, all, what, um, all what is um, clerical is... Um, now, um, let me put it this way. Profane uh, in German language marks um, the sphere outside of religion and outside, um, yeah, just, just civilian. I could, I could have used civilian large as well. Okay. I think, I think that will answer Siva's question. I have one from Bob Scott. In the slide on the lodge in Frankfurt number 11, the duel shows two hands shaking with a third uh -huh. from above, as if supporting the two. What is the significance of that? That's a pretty good question. I can't answer this, but I will, I will ask the uh, historian of the uh, Grand Lodge, um, of, of, the, of the Lodge Unity in Frankfurt, uh, and I'll give you the answer in the chat. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, from Dr. Douglas Nicol, I'm trying to find out more about the Masonic career of James Keith younger brother of the Jacobite Earl Marshal James Keith. He was mm -hmm. a, a general field marshal of the Royal Prussian Army under Frederick yes. der Gross, Frederick II. He died at the Battle of Hochkirk in Saxony. I know he mm -hmm. had a fairly extensive Masonic history, both in Russia and Prussia, but haven't been able to find very much. Can you guide me in the direction of any information on this? He came from the northeast of Scotland, where uh, Douglas is provincial grandmaster, and William I donated a statue to the town of Peterhead. Mm 
I had my photo taken beside it when I became Provincial Grandmaster of Aberdeenshire. And no doubt Douglas will share that photograph in the, the Facebook pages later this evening. Uh, and he also goes on to say it doesn't matter if the information is in German. Yes, <clears throat> that's, a good, that's a good thing because uh, indeed there is a book, um, a very, very good book about the early Peruvian lodges where we found, uh, where I'm pretty sure we were able to find information about uh, Brazo Keys. And I'll send you the link later on. That's brilliant. I'm sure Doug, Dr. Douglas Nick will be it's, happy it's with it. It's and um, it's, open, it, it's open for uh, research. And I, I'm sure you'll, your paths may cross in Edinburgh, where ours did on one of those public houses on the Royal Mile, and I'm sure he'll buy you a wee whiskey in return. <laughs> uh, another question from Siva for you, Rolf. If the Swedish Rite couldn't join the Grand Lodge in 1949 due to ritualistic difficulties, apart from possibly political, what was the nature of the ritualistic differences? Were these of a yeah, religious well, nature? Um... Yes and no. Um, two two main reasons. One reason is that the Swedish Rite at that time was strictly a, a ten degree system, and they were not able to um, join an organization which um, unites the three degrees of craft masonry. So, and they changed the system a little bit to make this possible in fifty eight. Okay. So this was the main thing, and the other thing um, has changed. Uh, still, still you have to be, uh, still you have to uh, recall Jesus as a grand master of the order. Um, but as part of the United Grand Lodges, uh, um, the Swedish Rite is open for visitation by anybody who is um, a regular brother in the Swedish Greece. Okay, thanks, Rolf. A question from Ian Smith. Why was the last Kaiser, Kaiser William II, so anti-Masonic if some of his predecessors as Kaisers Freemasons? <laughs> can't really answer, can't, can't really answer that. Uh, can't really answer that. Okay. Um, Just, no. It would be family choice, I suppose. Some people like it, some people don't. Probably. Probably. A comment, I think, from Ian McIntosh, who I think is a resident Jacobite expert. Uh, further information regarding the link that the Earl of Strathmore had with the German Masons in 1733. He would have been the seventh Earl, Grand Master of England, in 1733. His mm -hmm. brother was the eighth Earl, who was Grand Master of Scotland in 1740 and 41, oh. and Grand Master of England, 44 to 45. All the Strathmores were Jacobite supporters. That's quite interesting. So, uh, a comment from Claudio, uh, the American Canadian Grand Lodge and the British Freemasons uh, in Germany does not claim the position of Grand Master of the United Grand Lodges of Germany. Usually, usually um, the Grand Master of the United Grand Lodges um, is either from the uh, Grand Lodge AF and AM, and all from the Grand Lodge of the Swedish Rite. Um, somehow they, they always found a, found a solution for that. Um, and probably the Senate could have voted uh, for another person, but, uh, but it, still it haven't. Yeah. So. And possibly length of service in country as well. I wouldn't make it practical. No. Uh, that leads on very neatly to a question from uh, a recently retired serviceman uh, who I've got no doubt actually served in Germany at some point uh, during his career. Now that the British forces have moved out of Germany, is the Grand Lodge of British Freemasons still able to function? Do they have a healthy membership? Yes. Um, well, it's a the definition of, of healthy, but uh, many German brethren have um, joined the British Grand Lodge. And they even has established some new lodges um, with a mixed membership. So yes, uh, it's able to function. And um, the aim is to keep this tradition alive in Germany. Even with less British brothers in Germany, we, we want to um, keep this tradition of, of Freemasonry in Germany alive. And so um, this probably gives you an answer. 
Yeah, thing. I know when I visited the Star of Saxony Lodge at Rindalen, uh, they had quite a few local members as well as those from the base at the time, uh, and it was a really good mix. It's the same. It's a, it's the same in the American Canadian Grand Lodge. Um, there are also many many um, German brothers in the American Canadian Grand Lodge as well, so mm -hmm. for the same reasons. A question from Joseph Wages. Uh, was the source Hi, of the, uh, was the source of the first German rituals masonry dissected, or are there English rituals in French from England still extant? From what we know, it was uh, masonry dissected, um, but Joe Wages probably knows better because he's a well-known researcher in, on, on the subject. Um, George, you want to come in there? The, the pieces I found in the Illuminati craft ritual and the correspondence, it, it indicates that they copied a text uh, and they were going to the rituals prior to uh, strict observance rituals, but which exact one I can't find. I know there in Israelic Kai, there's one document that has German, but there's also French uh, headers on it too. It may be a clue, but I don't, I don't know that there's an original source ritual there, but maybe and the first lodges that Rolf mentioned, um, maybe one of their archives has something on the subject, but I haven't been able to flesh it out. Okay, thanks, Joe, for your input there. Very much appreciated. I, Rolf, a question from Michael Monroe, who I know is in uh, Paris, I believe. In which city in Germany is the Grand Lodge of the Swedish Rite? Pardon? In which uh, uh, city in Germany is the Grand Lodge of the Swedish Rite? In Berlin. In Berlin. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, another question from Siva. Uh, Brother Rolf mentioned 13th and 15th century lodges at the beginning of the presentation. The focus was mostly on the last 300 years. Could you say something more about masonry in Germany in the 13th to 17th centuries or even earlier? Um, as I said, uh, what we know is um, they did have uh, esoteric uh, knowledge. What we um, so they did have um, from a very early time non Masons as members as well, and um, they used uh, square compasses in nearly the same way as we do uh, today. But um, as I said, there was um, no connection between the Stone Masons and um, Freemasonry as it came from the British Isles, and um, the system of the the system of the stonemets tradition in Germany with the four main lodges um, was badly hurt in the in the seventy year war and in the thirty year wars uh, of Germany. So um, it it really lost uh, its importance. Okay, I, there's a comment from uh, Willie. I I think uh, Rolf was trying to say potentially operative lodges, uh, yeah. similar to profane yes. lodges. Yes. I, Mm -hmm. I, a question from David Park. When the Nazi party banned the Freemasons, is it true they adopted the forget-me-not flower instead of the square and compasses? Um, well, some have done probably, yes. Uh, I would, um, there's a wonderful paper from Alan Bernheim about the, the true story of the forget-me-not. And I cannot recommend it uh, this too much because it shows that uh, the forget-me-not um, as a symbol might have been in use in a very, very small percentage of German brothers, but not as uh, a commonly, commonly used symbol. Such, such was a nice, uh, a nice story, but indeed I fear it's only a story. Yeah, I think I've seen a, a few different tales about that on the, the Mr. Google site, Rolf, uh, with a couple <laughs> of different stories. So I uh, will leave that one in the dim and dist, but it's certainly <laughs> uh, a good opportunity for uh, Masonic retailers to sell, flog their pin badges anyway. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, a comment from Dr. Douglas Nicholl, William II apparently had a belief that British Freemasons and Jews had a great responsibility in causing both world wars. I see. 
Uh, he felt they aimed that they were aiming to take over the world. One book that I read described them as having some very paranoid beliefs. But should we believe all we read? Uh, yeah, well. Uh, a yeah, comment. And, uh, Sorry, hmm? Rolf. Yeah. No, I think this, um, as I said, this um, belief that uh, Jews and Freemasons were trying to take over the world is not, is, is not a German invention, as we see. Um, you, you, you find the stories everywhere, even in England. Um, but indeed, um, at that time, we were, I was talking about the end of the Weimar Republic. It was um, a public belief in, in um, sophisticated circles in Germany as well. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I think the final comment for this evening, Rolf, I'll leave with Jay de Costa, who says Hamburg would have been hosting the European Masonic Meeting 2020 if it had not been for the pandemic. And it was mm -hmm. a pleasure to pass on the mantle to a fine body of Bern. I wish our German Bern all the very best for the future, and I look forward to visiting when normal services resumed. I uh, thank you for a very informative, informative talk. Uh, and Derek Elders just put a link on the Forget Me Not story, Bern, in the chat. So, Bern, <laughs> Rolf, once again, thank you so much for a very interesting a presentation this evening. I'm sure uh, we've all uh, really got a lot out of uh, what we've heard from you this evening. And I've got a funny feeling the chat this evening will go on uh, quite a bit. Bern, uh, next week, I'm delighted to welcome back brother Mike Hearn, uh, who will talk to us about Freemasonry at sea and the first seaboard lo uh, seaborne lodges uh, in the military. Uh, that will be our normal seven o'clock start. Uh, the following week, Brian, I'm giving you early warning that uh, we have a brother from India coming to present to us on the history wow. uh, of Freemasonry in India. However, wow. uh, he has requested that we start at 6 p.m. Edinburgh time or UK time, uh, just so he, he's not having to wait up till the, the early hours of the morning. I will put plenty notice on the Facebook that it was a slightly changed time, uh, but hopefully many of you will be able to join us uh, two weeks this evening at six o'clock instead of seven o'clock. So, Brian, on behalf of Lodge Hope of Karachi, thank you once again for joining us. Uh, and as usual, I will uh, unmute everyone. I, I will first of all I stop Rolf's screen, I, I'll unmute you so you can say your thank yous uh, to Rolf. Uh, so. I think that's you unmuted, Brian. Uh. Thanks to Rolf and Gordon, excellent and very informative. Thanks Rolf, thanks Gordon. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Rolf. Gordon. That was absolutely Thanks, Gordon. superb. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Thank Rolf. You, Rolf. Gordon. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Rolf, for an excellent uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rolf. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Rolf. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Rolf, I have a question. Rolf. Okay, Ron, go ahead. I had a very good friend in England, and he was in the British Army during the, mm -hmm. during the Second World War. And I can't remember the uh, the place in Germany that he, he used to visit as a Freemason and visit a uh, Freemason's lodge. But he reckoned that he was fighting, actually shooting his gun towards the brother in Germany that was firing back during hostilities in World War II. Hmm. Now, would that, would that be a lapsed Freemason, a German Freemason, or would he have been an active Freemason? Um, if it was in World War II, there was no Freemasonry in Germany. Freemasonry was absolutely banned. No, that's, that's, that, that, um, that's, that's, that's what I thought after hearing your lecture. So the story he was telling me was all the nonsense. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> okay, Bern, I'll, on that point, I'll give you your normal five-second countdown. 
I look forward to joining you all on the Facebook for the chat and the recording will be live on our YouTube later on this evening. That's five. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, brethren. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Gordon. Ian, I'll give you one. Thank you, Gordon. Good evening. Thank you, brethren.